we, we finished on flow control, stop and wait and sliding window. There was one thing we skipped over, so let's just quickly cover that now and then we'll start on error control. We've always spoke about we send data frames, they contain so many bits or bytes of data. What's the best size? This is applied not just to flow control, error control, but all protocols. How big should a frame be? The size of a frame is normally defined or specified for a specific protocol. <coughs> that is, the designer of the protocol chooses the size of the header and the, usually the maximum amount of data that can be contained in a frame. So the size of the header is normally fixed or well defined. Depending on the protocol, it may, cont may contain things like sequence numbers, addresses, other information for checksums. We'll see examples of real headers in some later topics. So normally the header size is fixed. It ca carries information which is necessary for that protocol to communicate between both entities. But how much data should we include in one frame? That's the question that we'd quickly try and answer. Or at least look at the trade-offs here. So this is one of the slides back from, which is in the middle of flow control. Most protocols will often limit the size of data in every frame. That is, there'll be an upper, upper limit on the data size. The frame may carry less than the upper limit, but no more than the maximum size. What are the issues? What's the trade-offs for the size of the frame? Well. In short, large frames, the larger the amount of data inside there, minimizes the overheads. So let's consider an example to illustrate these trade-offs. Let's say that amount of data I want to send is 10,000 bits. I've got 10,000 bits of real data to send from A to B. And let's consider two different frame sizes two different maximum sizes of the frames. First one, a frame size which contains a maximum of 1,000 bits of data and a 20-bit header. So let's say every frame contains 20 bits of header and in option one, we allowed a maximum of 1,000 bits of data. And in the second option, we'll consider a frame size which has 100 bits of header, uh, 100 bits of data, and a 20-bit header. That is, we'll consider two different frame sizes, di different amounts of data: a large frame, small frame. We would need to transmit 10,000 bits of data. How many frames do I need in the first case? How many frames do I need? If my frame can contain 1,000 bits of data, I want to transmit 10,000 bits of data. How many frames do I need? I have 10,000 bits of data to send. Every frame has a maximum of 1,000 bits of data. How many frames? 10 frames, simple. The number of frames to transmit all of this data would be 10. Every frame contains 1,000 bits of real data and 20 bits of header. So what's the total overhead in this case? What's the total overhead? 10 frames, what's the total amount of header? 200 bits of header. Every frame contains 20 bits of header we have 10 frames, so we have a total overhead of 200 bits. That is, I send the data as frames. In the end, I've transmitted 10,000 bits of real data and 200 bits of overhead. Let's do the same with a smaller frame. 
a frame with 100 bits of data. Still want to transmit 10,000 bits of real data. How many frames do I need? 100 frames needed. Each frame contains 20 bits of header, so the total overhead will be 100 times 20, which is 2,000 bits. Larger frames minimize the header overheads. Just keep considering these two different examples. This is better because we have less overheads. This is worse because as we, to transmit the same amount of real data, we need to transmit more overhead, less efficient. Lower the efficiency, lower the throughput. That's the first point here. Consider a different case now. What happens if of the 10,000 bits sent, there's one bit in error? So. I want to transmit 10,000 bits of data. It turns out one of those bits is in error. And the scheme that we're going to use, and we'll go through the details, the scheme we'll use for error control, retransmit the frame that is in error. So if I have a frame that has an error in it, I'll need to send that frame again. Coming back to our first case, a thousand bits of data, ten frames. I transmit ten frames. Of the ten thousand bits, one of them is in error, so there's one frame in error. We don't know which one, it doesn't matter. I send ten frames, one of those frames has one bit in error. Therefore, from the receiver's perspective, it assumes the entire frame is unusable. To fix that, it will ask the sender to send that one frame again. So we'll say one frame in error, we need to retransmit one frame, send again one frame, and in fact that involves sending again 1,000 bits of data plus the 20 bits of header. So in this case, if there's one frame in error, we'll need to retransmit one frame which contains 1,000 bits of data. In total, we send 10 frames plus the one retransmission, 11 frames. In this case, we have 100 frames. Only one bit is in error. Again, one frame will be in error. So one of those 100 frames inside there, one of those bits will be wrong. The receiver will detect that and ask the source to send that one frame again. So again, we have one frame in error. We'll retransmit that one frame. That one frame is only 100 bits. In this case, if we have just one bit error, we have to send the original 10 frames plus an extra 1,000 bits, the 11th frame. In this case, we have to transmit the original, original 100 frames plus one extra frame, the 101st frame, but that one extra frame only contains 100 bits of data. Potentially, using smaller frame sizes means we have to retransmit less in the case of errors, and that can be an advantage. If I only have to retransmit a little bit to fix that error, then I have less overhead. If I have to retransmit everything, a large frame, then that's more overhead. That's this point here. 
if we have to retransmit data using small frames, introduces less overhead. That's the, an advantage of using small frames. In that specific example, you could determine what the total overhead was. That is, 10 frames plus the 11th The one retransmitted, 10 plus 1, every frame contains 1,000 bits of data plus 20 bits of header. In this case, we send 100 frames plus the one retransmitted. Every frame contains 100 bits of data plus 20 bits of header. In fact, although I don't know the answer, you'll find that this one is less than this. Even with one retransmission, this one we need to transmit less to get the original data across the other side. This one would be better. But if we had a different size frame, or a different size header, smaller frames can give us the advantage of retransmitting less. So we need to trade off. What happens if there are errors? We want to have small frames, so we retransmit less. But the smaller the frame, the more overhead of the header. So it's not simple as to choosing the best size frame. If there were no errors, this case is better. If there were one bit or one frame in error, you need to compare the cases. If there were 10 frames in error, then I think you'll find that this case is much better. In this case, if there are 10 frames in error, we have to retransmit everything. In this case, we only retransmit 10 of the 100 frames. So there's a trade-off there. The main point is to understand these trade-offs. Another trade-off with the frame size, smaller frames are better if the receiver buffer is limited. Let's say our receiver has a buffer size of 5,900 bits. Case one, how many frames can it fit? Case one, how many frames can fit in the receive buffer? The received buffer is 5,900 bits. Case one, where we have 1,000 bits per frame, how many frames can the receiver handle at once? How many? Six times 1,000 is what? Six times 1,000 is 6,000. We've only got room for 5,900. How many frames? Five. In this case, every frame, if it contains 1,000 bits, but we only have buffer space for 5,900, then we could fit five frames of 1,000 bits in size. Option A. Case B, if we have smaller frames, how many frames can we fit in the buffer? Case B, we have 100 bits per frame. 59 frames. If we have the smaller frame, 100 bits per frame, a buffer of, of 5,900 bits, we could fit 59 frames. Using smaller frames, we make more efficient use of the receive buffer. In this case, we cannot use the remaining 900 bits. In this case, we can. In case A, we only use 5,000 of the 5,900 bits. Those 900 bits cannot be used. That's sort of wasting the receive buffer. In this case, we use all 5,900 bits. So 
smaller frames can allow more data to be sent when the receive buffers are limited. So that's the advantage of smaller frames. Last case, smaller frames give, allow for more efficient sharing amongst multiple users. Let's say the frames involve transmitting data and for an example the transmission is someone talking. Everyone wants to talk. Actually a better case, your database presentations, how long did you have to, to present? Ten minutes. So in one lecture we have, what, 80 minutes? If you have 10 minutes per group, then you can have eight groups present in the one lecture. The next eight groups will have to wait another day to the next lecture. That can be unfair to those eight groups that have to wait until the next day. Let's say you only had five minutes presentation, a smaller transmission time. Then in the one lecture you can fit 16 groups transmit, 16 groups present and therefore no groups have to wait the next day to transmit. That's fairer amongst those 16 groups because everyone gets a chance to transmit on that day, they don't have to wait. Let's say your presentation was one hour. You transmit for a long time. Then one group transmits the first day, the next group the next day, the last group is going to transmit in four weeks time. That's unfair to that group because they have to wait a long time before they get an opportunity to present or to transmit. So without going through a detailed example, smaller frames, smaller transmission time, when we have multiple people wanting to transmit, it gives everyone a chance to transmit. You don't have to wait as long before you get a chance to transmit. If you have large frames, you may have to wait a long time before it's your opportunity to transmit. So different trade-offs involved there with what's the best frame size. There's no one answer. Normally protocols will define the maximum size based on what their purpose is. Now we want to look at how do we retransmit? We set an example, if there's an error, we'll retransmit a frame. How does that work? Error control. <coughs> One scheme we know for error control, and you did it in the exam, was forward error correction. You saw an example of hamming based error control. Transmit a code word. If that code word is different, or the code word received is different from the valid code word, we can potentially correct the error. That's error correction. Another way to fix errors, if the receiver identifies an error, it detects an error, ask the sender to send again. That's what we'll cover today. So often we have errors, we need to detect and correct them. In terms of frames and data link layer protocols, we don't focus so much on bit errors, we talk about frame, frame errors. We receive a frame, if some bits are in error, we can say that that frame is damaged. We've received it, but it's not correct. We need to fix that case. Another case may be A transmits a frame, it doesn't get to B the link fails and the entire frame is not received. We say that that frame is lost. It's not received by the destination. We need to handle that case as well. They are both cases of frame errors. That is, there's an error in the frame transmission. We know error detection techniques and forward error control. We've discussed that before. Other approaches use positive acknowledgements. Send a frame. If the destination receives the frame, it sends back an acknowledgement saying, thank you, I received your frame. It's a positive acknowledgement in that it's saying, or it's giving the source a positive indication that it's been received. So that's one approach we'll cover. If we don't receive an acknowledgement, so I send a frame, 
I'm waiting for an acknowledgement. If I don't receive one within some timeout period, then I may retransmit that frame. So that's another technique we use. A source retransmits a frame that has not been acknowledged. And we may also use negative acknowledgements. I transmit a frame, the source detects an error, it can send back an acknowledgement saying, I just received something but it was in error. Please send again. That's a negative acknowledgement. These techniques combined are called automatic repeat request protocols. That is, we automatically repeat or have a request to repeat the transmission of the data. ARQ protocols. The first one we'll go through is based on stop and wait flow control, and it's simply called stop and wait ARQ. And the second two we'll go through are based on sliding window flow control. Go back N and selective reject. Stop and wait, very similar to stop and wait flow control, but now we ask for retransmissions if there are errors. Stop and wait in that we transmit one frame, wait for an acknowledgement. After transmitting a frame, the source stores a copy of that frame that it just sent in case it has to send it again and starts some timer. Transmit the frame, start a timer, and we're waiting for an acknowledgement to come back. If the ACK is received, Stop the timer and move on to the next frame. Do the same. Transmit the next frame, start the timer, a new timer, wait for an ACK. If no ACK is received before our timer expires, so we have an upper limit of our timer, a timeout interval, then retransmit the copy of the frame that we have. Retransmit the one we just sent. So that's the retransmission scheme. The destination that receives data, whenever it receives a frame, it sends an ACK. If that frame is received with no errors. So if everything's okay, receive data, same as normal stop and wait flow control, receive data, send an ACK. If the frame is received but it contains errors, we say it's a damaged frame, then we throw that away at the receiver. We discard that frame. We ignore it. We do not send an ACK. As a result, eventually the source will not receive an ACK before its timer expires and will retransmit. Hopefully the second time they send, it will not contain errors. It will not be damaged. For stop and wait to work, <coughs> we'll show the case where it's needed. We also need sequence numbers, just a one-bit sequence number. We'll show why through some examples. Same with stop and wait flow control. It's very simple. Stop and wait ARQ is simple, but can be very inefficient. Here's an example of the normal situation where there's no errors. A has some data to send to B. At some point in time, some data arrives from the higher layer. We transmit that in a frame. We give that frame a sequence number. A one-bit sequence number, meaning we're going to have sequence number 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1. Sequence number 0, transmit the frame, it propagates, it arrives. In this example, B receives it, takes the data from the frame, delivers it to the higher layer, everything's okay. Send the act back. And as we've seen in flow control, the sequence number in the act or more, we often call that an acknowledgement number, the ACK number, indicates the next sequence number expected. We just received data with sequence number zero. Here's the acknowledgement saying, thank you, I received that data, I now expect sequence number one. So this is the case with no errors. That comes back. In the meantime, at the source A, there was more data to send. The application generated more data at this point in time. We could not send it. We're using the stop and wait mechanism. We can only send one data frame at a time 
and then we have to wait for the ACK before sending the next piece of data. When we receive the ACK, A knows that data zero was successful. No errors. So we transmit the next piece of data. Data with sequence number one arrives. When the data is processed, so this shows some processing time, B looks at the data, does some processing, eventually delivers that data to the higher layer at the receiver, everything's done, sends the ACK with a one-bit sequence number, sequence number zero, one, the next sequence number expected is zero again. We wrap around, zero, one, zero, one, zero, one. ACK comes back, we had some data to send, we send that data, and the ACK here will come back, and we can keep going. This is not complete here. So this is just stop and wait with no errors. So that's the easy case. Although it's not shown here, whenever A transmits data, you can think it starts a timer. And it has some maximum timeout interval. That is, we start the timer counting, and if it reaches the maximum value, we will retransmit. In this case, it did not reach the maximum value. And, all right, so now let's consider a more interesting case. What happens if there's an error? What happens if we lose data? This arrow indicates that the data link layer has received data from the higher layer to transmit to the other side. We receive it, transmit that data. Sequence number zero. The sequence number would be included in the header of the data frame. After transmitting, we cannot send any more. We have to wait for an ACK. Propagates across. B receives that, sends back an ACK. Receive data with sequence number zero. Expect the next frame to have sequence number one. When we, when we looked at the flow control, we called this frame a uh, receive ready. You saw on the slides, receive ready. In my diagrams here, it's the same as an acknowledgement, a positive acknowledgement. And the act comes back. No problems. In the meantime, we've received more data to send. So A transmits the first piece of data, is waiting for an act has more data to send at this point in time, cannot send it because we're using stop and wait, waiting for an ACK, receive the ACK. So now we can transmit the next data frame. And sequence number one. Data zero, data with sequence number one. Let's assume there's a problem with our link. The data is lost. This second data frame doesn't get to the destination. There's an error, link fails, data doesn't arrive at B. Actually, we're going to run out of space. After transmitting the data, After transmitting the data, we saved a copy of it and started a timer. Start some clock. If the timer reaches some, what we call, timeout interval, we'll retransmit. 
Where are we going to go? Here. You can keep drawing down there, but I'm going to move this up to here. Just so I have space, I've just repeated this part here. This is lost data. B doesn't know it's lost. B is just sitting there waiting to receive data. It doesn't get to B, so B doesn't know it was sent. A is has transmitted the data, is waiting for an act. Waiting, 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 and once the timer reaches some set timeout interval, let's say it was here, then it gives up waiting and tries again, that it, it retransmits. So this timeout interval is something defined in the protocol. Maybe it's 10 milliseconds transmit the data, wait for 10 milliseconds. If you don't receive the ACK, retransmit. The same frame with the same sequence number. This frame was the first piece of data, data 1. The second frame transmitted was data 2. This is a retransmission of the second frame. It's identical to this. Contains the same data as this one. Same sequence number. This time we're lucky. The frame gets to the other side. So B sends back an acknowledgement. Act number zero. We just received data with sequence number one. The next data expected is zero. With stop and wait, the sequence numbers, with stop and wait ARQ, the sequence numbers are one bit. That is zero, one, zero, one. We just continue using zero, one, alternating between the values. Data frame 0, and that's this one, data frame 1. Retransmission of data frame 1. Receive an act this time, everything was okay. We'd now send data 0. And we could continue to be, assuming there's no errors. Same as w which was on the previous slide. So the difference here is if the data frame does not arrive at B, then B will not send an acknowledgement because B knows nothing about that data frame. So A, after transmitting the data frame, starts a timer waiting for the ACK. If that timer reaches a predefined timeout interval, it will no longer wait for the ACK but retransmit. Send the same frame again. Hopefully it will arrive without error. It will not be lost the second time. If so, we'll get the act and we move on to the next frame. If this one is lost as well, we can do the same again. Wait for an act, retransmit. If it's lost again, wait for an act, retransmit. And a protocol will normally have the maximum number of retransmits. We will not try forever. It may say, OK, try four times. If after retransmitting four times you get no acknowledgement, then tell the application there's an error. Let's draw that as another example.
So there's another parameter as part of the stop and wait ARQ protocol, the maximum number of retransmits. Let's say it has a value 4. Then if we send data and it's lost, retransmit, the first retransmit, if that's lost, we'll try again. That is, transmit the data, waiting for an ACK, timeout, TO means timeout, that is, waiting for an ACK, no ACK, timer expires, retransmit, that gets lost, no ACK, timer expires, the timeout occurs, retransmit. If everything's lost, with a maximum number of retransmits to four, first, second, third, fourth retransmit, timeout, retransmit, no ACK, timeout, retransmit, last timeout, tell the application or the higher layer there's an error. We couldn't deliver your data to the other side. So maybe the, the higher layer will get some notification that there's an error with the link. We cannot send the data. Similar concept when you access a website and that website's not available, where you cannot connect. You get a, you click on a link to visit a website. If there's some error, eventually, even after many retries, you'll get some page back saying, error, I could not connect because we just couldn't deliver the data. That's the same concept here. So after a maximum number of retries, we'll give up. We cannot deliver the data. But that shouldn't happen if we have a good link with just a small number of errors. In most cases, the errors may be random and we only have a small number of errors. So we may lose one frame but the chance of losing the next frame should be very low. So by retransmitting, we increase our chances of getting the data to the other side. So two parameters that we've got. What is the timeout interval? That needs to be defined. What's the maximum number of retransmits? They are something that would be defined for a protocol. Next case, all right, we'll draw it on the board. What happens if we lose an ACK? Consider the sim same case here, but we lose an acknowledgement in response. Let's say we'll continue from this, this point here. Data 0 was successful. We transmit data 1. Data frame 1 arrives at B. Everything's successful. B sends an ACK in response saying, thank you, I now expect frame zero. The ACK is lost. There's an error in the link, and the acknowledgement doesn't come back to the destination, uh, back to A, the source. So what happens from B? The same as before. After transmitting this frame, we start the timer. waiting for an ACK, waiting, waiting, waiting. We don't know whether the data got to be. We don't know if the ACK was lost. We haven't received anything. We're waiting, we're waiting. We expect to receive an ACK. Eventually, we will time out. TO, we have a timeout. Our timer expires, and we retransmit. send the same data frame. Note, 
what's happened at B. B received the data successfully. And it delivered that data. In our case, it was data 2. First piece of data was sent and delivered. Then we sent the second piece of data, data 2. It was received by B, and B sent that data to the next higher layer at the receiver. That is, it successfully received this data. It sent the ACK. B doesn't know that the ACK was lost. It just transmitted. B thinks everything was successful. A doesn't know that the data was received. A was waiting for an ACK. It timed out. It didn't receive the ACK. Therefore, retransmits. From A's perspective, it looks the same as this case. Transmitted the data, I didn't receive the ACK, therefore I'll retransmit. We retransmit that, and let's assume it gets there successfully. B now receives data with sequence number one. B identifies a problem. The previous data frame received had sequence number one. The next frame received has sequence number one but I've already received frame with sequence number one. We expect to receive alternating sequence number, one, zero, one, zero, one, zero. So in this case, B recognizes, ah, this is the same data as previous, the previous data frame received. My ACK must have been lost. B discards the data. The data inside this frame is data 2. We previously received that and processed that data. We receive a retransmission of that. We throw it away. Delete it. We do not send it to the higher layer. But what we do, we discard the data. We do send back an acknowledgement. Same acknowledgement as if we received data with sequence number 1. Next data expected is 0. If that's successful, then A has received the ACK and can move on. And we can conti continue from there. So the point here is that if the ACK is lost, A doesn't know that. A retransmits. But since we've already received the data, if we receive it again, and the way that we know we receive it again is if it has the same sequence number as the previous one, we expect them to alternate if they're the same, then discard that data. Do not use it. But send back an ACK to let A know that we've already received it. We're expecting sequence number zero. If the ACK comes back, then we can move on. We don't want to receive data twice and process it twice because that would be a duplicate of the data. What if the data was a message saying transfer a million baht into Steve's account? So the data contains some message that tells the application at the bank server to transfer one million baht into my bank account. If the ACK was lost and we retransmitted that same message, if we didn't discard that data, if we accepted it and sent it to the application, then an application would then transfer a second 1 million baht into my account, which is not intended. So we discard the data, that is, we don't use it. But we do send an act to tell the source A that we've received it, move on to the next frame. That's why we need sequence numbers in stop and wait ARQ. Because the way that B knows that this is the same as the previous data frame is because of the sequence number is the same. If we didn't have sequence numbers, there's no way for B to know is this data the same as the previous one or is it intended to be the same or is it just a duplicate? So with a sequence number, B can recognize, OK, this is a copy of or a duplicate of the previous frame, therefore I'll discard it. And we only need a one-bit sequence number to differentiate. 
So in stop and wait flow control, we did not have sequence numbers. In stop and wait ARQ, we do have a one-bit sequence number to prevent duplicate data to be received so we can discard it. We can do analysis of looking at the performance the same as we analyze flow control, but we'd use the same approaches. But that's the basics of stop and wait. Any questions before we move on to the next ARQ mechanism? And the next ones we're going to go through quite quickly, so you need to understand this to understand the next two. So in a quiz or an exam question, you could answer things, how long does it take to transmit the data if, for example, the ACK is lost? If you knew what the timeout interval was, let's say it was 100 milliseconds, then if this, at, from this time to this time, would be 100 milliseconds. And you could calculate the time, transmission time, timeout interval, transmission, and the propagation and so on. So you can do similar calculations with flow control. How long does it take from here to here? What's the throughput if we lose one packet, for example? So long as you know what the timeout interval is, that is, how long do we wait? And also, if necessary, what's the maximum number of retransmissions? If we reach the maximum number of retransmissions, we do not deliver the data, we get an error. The timeout interval is a parameter of the protocol, and that needs to be selected. How long should it be? How long should the timeout interval be? It should not be too long because if we wait for too long and don't get an answer, we'll waste the time. So in that example, I transmitted the message. How long should the timeout interval be? I waited for a long time before I resent the message. If there's no response coming, then that will be inefficient. I transmit and wait for a long time, and therefore, if I don't receive anything, I'll spend a lot of time waiting. If the timeout interval is very long, and there's no response coming, then that will be inefficient. What if we have a very short time interval? How long should the timeout interval be? 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 If it's very short, it doesn't give him a chance to respond. I transmit. I'm waiting for a response. He doesn't have time to send a response. I retransmit again because my timeout interval is very small. And I've become very inefficient because I spend all my time resending and don't get any acknowledgement. Although it's the last slide, I think we can illustrate that. Maybe we can do it over here. On the last slide of this, or, or towards the end, there's some explanation of how long it should be. But those points, if the timeout interval is very long, if we transmit and the data is lost, and we have a long timeout interval, and then retransmit, then we waste all this time. That is, we spend all this time waiting for an ACK. We're not going to receive the ACK because our data was lost. And we'll be inefficient in transmitting. We'll retransmit. And then if we're successful, it took all this time to get one piece of data to the other side. So a long time out interval, if we lose data, will lead to inefficiencies because we spend a lot of time waiting. 
if we have a short time interval, a timeout interval, even if the data gets to the other side, I time out and retransmit. There's some propagation delay. And retransmit. And retransmit. If I have a short timeout interval, I send my data. I haven't received an ACK. Send again, send again, send again. I haven't received an ACK because it's taking some time to propagate. And even if the data is received successfully, it takes some time for the ACK to come back. So in this case, if the timeout interval is too short, we waste time transmitting data that we don't need to, retran we don't need to retransmit. Because in fact, the data and the ACK is coming back. So the timeout interval should be large enough to allow an act to come back. So it should be larger than the time it takes to get the data there and the act back. But it should not be too large such that if we lose data, we spend a lot of time waiting. So there's a trade-off there. And in many cases, it's hard to predict how long do we wait. If I ask you a question, how long should the timeout interval be? I need to know or predict. How long am I going to wait before I'll retransmit? Well, I need to know something about the environment. How long does it take for that person to process the data and send back a response? I need to give them enough time to respond, but not too much time, such that if they don't know the answer, I'll wait forever for a response. So, they're the trade-offs, and that although not illustrated, I think on slide after go back in and selective reject, there's some words about that. We want to go through the last two techniques today so we can finish this topic. Same with stop and wait flow control, stop and wait ARQ can be inefficient. Send one, wait for an ACK. Very simple, but spend a lot of time waiting in some cases. Go back N is based upon the sliding window flow control, where we are allowed to send a window size of frames and then wait for an ACK. So the same concepts apply with sliding window. Send a set of frames is allowed. We use sequence numbers. If there's no errors, then the ACK will come back and indicate what we're, that we're allowed to send more. Same as sliding window. If an error is detected by the destination, then the destination can reply with a negative act, or call it a rejection message. If the destination recognizes there's an error, it can send back this special message saying, I've, re I've received some data, but there's an error. Please resend. So a negative act in this case, or a reject message. In the case that the destination detects an error, that frame that is detected in an error is discarded, and all future frames until that frame is received correctly are discarded. We'll show that on the next slide. Because with sliding window, we can send a set of frames. Let's say we send seven frames at once, or frame zero through to frame six. Some of those frames may be received in error, some may be received successfully. When we receive a negative ACK, the original source goes back and retransmits that frame that was lost, or that was in error, and all subsequent frames. We'll look at this part after we explain that with the example. Maybe hard to see here, Maybe a little bit easier on your slides. Sliding window, we can send a set of frames before waiting for the act. So we're sending frames here, frame zero, and in fact we go up to frame seven and then wrap around to frame zero. And in this specific example, B is sending an act receive ready, 
same as our sliding window. Receive ready is the meaning of a positive acknowledgement. We're ready to receive more. So the first two frames arrive OK. We get an act. Everything's normal. Frame four is lost. It doesn't get to the destination. From B's perspective, it has received frames 0 and 1 and has acknowledged them by sending a receive ready 2. Receive ready 2 means I'm ready to receive frame 2. It's an acknowledgement saying everything up until 2 has been successfully received. I've received 0 and 1. I'm now ready to receive frame 2, which implies frames 0 and 1 have been acknowledged. So the, here's a case where we're not sending an acknowledgement for every frame received. It could have been different and we could have sent an acknowledgement after frame 0, but we'd get a similar result, I think. Receive two frames, send an ACK, a positive ACK, call to receive ready, acknowledging both of those frames at once. Receive 2 and 3, send an ACK, I'm now ready to receive frame 4. So this is the normal behaviour. Frame 4 and 5 are transmitted. 4 is lost. It doesn't arrive at B. 5 is received. B detects an error. B has received frame 0, 1, 2 and 3. And then frame 5. We expect to receive frames in sequence. We just received frame 3. We sent back a message saying we're ready to receive frame 4. But from B's perspective, the next thing we, rec we receive is frame 5. We're expecting 4, but we receive 5. Something went wrong. I'll assume frame 4 was lost. There's an error. So now, since B has detected an error, it sends back a negative ACK, a reject message. We send back this reject message saying we're expecting, we're still expecting to receive frame 4. Although I've received frame 5, I'm going to discard that frame 5 because I expect to receive frames in order. If the last one I received was 3, then I must receive frame 4 next. If I don't, everything else is going to be discarded. That is, frame 5, even though we successfully received it, we throw it away. We do not store it in memory. We send back the reject to inform A, we're still expecting frame 4. There must have been an error with that. In the meantime, A has sent 5 and 6. 6 will be discarded by the receiver because we're still expecting 4. When this reject is received by A, A recognises something's gone wrong. I've sent 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 and 6. I receive a reject. B is expecting frame 4, so I need to retransmit frame 4 and every subsequent frame that I've transmitted already, which means 4, 5 and 6. Reject 4, I retransmit frame 4, and the frames that I've sent since 4, which is 5 and 6. And this is where go back n comes from. Source A goes back and retransmits the n frames since the lost one. In this specific case, we lost frame 4, we had transmitted 5 and 6, when we receive the reject, we retransmit frame 4, 5 and 6. If they are received successfully, B has received 0, 1, 2, 3, 5 and 6 it discarded, it threw them away. So next it receives 4, sends an ACK, receive ready for 5, receives 5, receives 6, sends an ACK, receive ready for 7. The ACK gets lost in this case. Frame 7, frame, so from A's perspective, 
five, six, seven, zero have been transmitted. We're waiting for an ACK. We received previously an ACK indicating the next frame is five. We've sent five, six, seven, and zero. We're not going to receive this receive ready seven because it was lost. So eventually we will time out. We're waiting for an ACK. We time out and we send this special message saying, I'm looking for a acknowledgement, a positive ACK. It's described on the previous slide. If we lose an ACK, if there's no response after some timeout interval, then the source may send a special ACK. This is the source sending it. It's an ACK request, or in the diagram shown as RR with a particular bit set. But it's a request for an acknowledgement. I've sent you some data. I have not received an ACK. Please send me the, an ACK for the data that I've sent. So it's a request for an ACK from the destination. When the destination receives an ACK request, it will send an acknowledgement. This is useful if we lose an ACK in the response. That is in this case. We've sent some data. The ACK was sent, but it was lost. We're waiting for an ACK. We're waiting for an ACK. We time out. We've waited too long. Request an ACK saying, I want an acknowledgement for the data that I've already sent to you. It sends an ACK, this time it gets through, and it indicates I'm ready to receive frame one. Frame one because zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and zero have been successful. B has received all of these in order. Next one is frame one. Frame one, frame two, we can keep going. So the first point to recognize, go back N. If the destination detects an error, and one way to detect an error is if we receive frames out of order, receive zero, one, two, three, five, that's an error. I'm missing frame four. If we detect this, send a reject message or a negative act, saying I'm still expecting frame four. When A receives this reject message, it will go back and retransmit frame four and all the frames sent since four, which is five and six in this example. So that's go back N. Go back and retransmit N frames. And if we lose an act, what happens? Request for another act. Good, we request for an act. And here, in this diagram, it's shown as this RR with a P bit equal to 1. But think of it as a request, a special message requesting an ACK. We've sent some data. We haven't received a reject message. We're expecting an ACK. We don't receive one within a timeout period. Request an ACK. B will send an ACK receive ready with a number indicating what's the next frame in order that it expects to receive. We always expect to receive data in order. 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 0, next should be 1. 1, 2, and we can keep going. This can be better than stop and wait in that we can send multiple frames before having to wait for an ACK. Same concept as sliding window. It can be more efficient. And to handle errors, we go back and retransmit the frames that have been lost and that we've sent since we lost that frame. Selective reject is very similar. Same scenario, send some frames, lose frame four, five and six arrive. We send, when we receive frame five, a message, a reject message, a selective reject. 
means I'm expecting to receive frame 4. The difference between go back n, and the only difference here is that frames 5 and 6 are not discarded by B, but they are buffered by B. B receives 0, 1, 2, and 3, everything's okay. 4 was lost. B receives 5, uh, it detects an error. I was expecting 4, I receive 5. Something's gone wrong. I will send a message to A indicating I'm still expecting 4, a reject message. In the meantime, 5 and 6 are buffered by B, saved in a buffer in memory. When A receives this selective reject, it retransmits only frame 4. That is, we reject a particular, a selected message. Retransmits frame 4, and when B receives frame 4, it's now received 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6. And can send an act saying, now I expect 7. So the only difference here, go back N, if we lose data, subsequent frames are discarded by the receiver. In selective reject, if we lose data, subsequent frames are stored in a buffer by the receiver. In this example, it's frames 5 and 6. The advantage from selective reject is that A only retransmits frame 4, not 4, 5 and 6. Because 5 and 6 are saved in the buffer and we reduce the number of retransmissions. So this improves the efficiency. Everything else is the same. Selective reject or selective retransmission only frames that are rejected are retransmitted. In the previous example, only frame 4 was retransmitted. In go back n, 4, 5 and 6 were trans retransmitted. We can do that because the destination will buffer frames that have been received after that error frame. It buffered 5 and 6. The good thing about selective reject compared to go back n, it minimizes retransmissions. We don't have to retransmit all frames, only just that one frame. That's a good thing. The bad thing about selective reject is that it must maintain a buffer. And it must be large enough con to contain frames which may be received out of order. So in this previous example, it had to store frames 5 and 6 in some memory. That increases the memory requirements. And it's more complex to implement. That is, the code to implement this is more complex than go back n. As a result, in fact, in practice, go back n is more widely used than selective reject. Go back n is simpler, doesn't require as much memory at the receiver, but go back n results in more retransmissions to c compared to selective reject. Go back n is more widely used. Selective reject is specifically used in satellite links where we don't want to do many retransmissions because they're very costly. So in summarizing these two approaches, they both use sliding window mechanisms in that they allow the sender to send multiple frames before it has to wait for an act. More efficient compared to stop and wait. Go back in. We want to receive frames in order. If not, we detect an error. If we detect an error, we'll inform the source and the source will go back and retransmit the end frames since that one error one and the subsequent frames. In selective reject, We'll inform the source that there was an error. We will buffer subsequent frames, and the source will go back and retransmit that one frame. And put them back into order. Frame 0, 1, 2, 3, 5, 6, 
and four are received, put them back in the right order, and then keep going. Everything's okay from then on. Seven, zero, and so on. The timeout and the ACK is the same as in go back in. And again, in your next quiz, which is next week, or in your exam, you can answer questions comparing these three approaches. You can calculate the timing, how long does it take to get the data delivered to the other side if we lose one packet, one frame. And questions about the performance of those three different approaches. Stop and wait, ARQ. Go back N, ARQ and selective reject ARQ. We still have time. We have, I think, one or two slides to remaining. Any questions? We haven't gone through go back in on selective reject in a lot of detail because it's the same concept as sliding window. We just show the differences. And stop and wait ARQ, same concept as flow control, stop and wait but we retransmit if we detect an error. Any questions before we finish this topic? Everything's okay? Good. Any problems? You're okay, you're on the assignment. Any problems? What's better about go back N compared to selective reject? Simple question. Compare go back N to selective reject. What, what's better about go back N? Quick. My timeout interval is getting shorter. What's better about go back in? You help him? Go back in compared to selective reject, what's better? Selective reject has better efficiency. What's better about go back in? He's correct. Selective reject can be better efficiency because we retransmit less with selective reject. What's good about go back in? Simpler. It's simpler. Simpler to implement at the receiver and uses less memory at the receiver. And simplicity is useful when you have very small devices. You need to minimize the cost of implementing the receivers. Simplicity is important. So understand the trade-offs between them. We've spoke about the timeout intervals. Some examples of real protocols that use these mechanisms. We're not going to go through them. HDLC is one protocol used over links. It uses go back N or selective reject. This one you may have used in connections via your ISP point to point protocol commonly used by internet service providers. Doesn't include flow control. Uses forward error correction and CRCs for error control. And we're going to spend an entire topic on local area networks. Ethernet, the cable from my laptop to the wired LAN, they use some of the mechanisms we talk about here. And that finishes for this topic. And finishes our lecture for today. <laughs>